This video is sponsored by NVIDIA and SCAN. If you saw my last two videos, you'll know that Nvidia and Scan have teamed up to sponsor a series of videos on this channel about Nvidia Studio, which is a program where Nvidia works directly with computer manufacturers to empower digital creatives with the best possible experience. To show off the power of studio devices, I'm making this entire video using an Aero 15 laptop from Gigabyte, which is part of the studio range. Blender can utilise RTX graphics cards to speed up your workflow even on a laptop. With features like AI powered denoising, blazing fast optics rendering and GPU accelerated motion blur, we'll talk more about that later. Visit the link in the description to see Scan's whole range of Nvidia Studio devices. So in order to make an animation like this, I think it's really important that we nail the Star Wars aesthetic. I've got two fantastic models here which I've downloaded from Sketchfab. I'll leave a link in the description to both these models, but obviously you can use any spaceship model that you like. I'm using Eevee to set the scene up, but I will be rendering out the final video in cycles. In the Eevee settings, just enable Ambient Occlusion, Screen Space Reflections and Bloom. So to make a space environment, obviously we're going to need some stars. Go into the Shader Editor and change the workspace from Object to World. Make sure you've got the little checkbox enabled that says Use Nodes. You can make a star field really easily just by plugging in a noise texture into a colour ramp and then feeding the output of that into the environment node. If we bump up the noise scale and we crush in the black values on the colour ramp, we get all these really nice dots that look like stars. Just play with the detail and the roughness setting on the noise texture and you'll get all these different effects. You can also change the colour ramp from linear to constant, that'll make the stars a little bit less blurry. You can increase the brightness of the stars as well just by increasing the strength of the environment node. Obviously in space the only light source is the sun. So we're going to add in a sun lamp. It doesn't matter where you place it because Blender treats it as like it's infinitely far away. But you can just rotate it and that'll change the direction of the light. The shadows on our model right now are completely black. That's realistic for space but it's not quite correct for the Star Wars aesthetic. To increase the brightness of the shadows, we can just use a little trick. Duplicate the environment node and plug both of the environments into a mix shader. Give the new environment a dark grey colour with a little bit of a blue tint. Then add a light path node in the shader editor. There's an option there at the top called Is Camera Ray, just plug that into the mix node. Now the top environment node is going to act as the lighting for the scene, but only the bottom node is going to be visible to the camera. You can just experiment with the shade and the strength of the top node until you get a lighting effect that looks right. Finally, just go into the Render Properties page and under Colour Management change it to be Medium High Contrast. Controlling the position of spaceships can be a real pain when you're trying to animate them, especially if the model's split into multiple parts. To make your life easier, what you can do is just create a new empty object and place it just above or on the centre of mass. That's the place where you want the pivot point to be, where the ship will rotate from. Select the whole mesh for the spaceship, and then with Ctrl held down, select the empty. Then use Ctrl P and just parent the ship to the empty object. Rename the empty whatever you want, and now if we move the empty object around, the whole ship should follow it. Right, so now we've got our scene in place, but it wouldn't be a Star Wars fight without some blaster bolts going off. I looked online to see how other people have tackled animated lasers in Blender and frankly there wasn't really any good solutions. I did find this one example which is really cool, but the effect breaks if the gun starts to move around and obviously our spaceship's going to be constantly flying around so we're going to need a different method. So what we're going to do is move the spaceships up above the centre of the screen to create a little bit of space and then we're going to add a circle object into Blender. Give the circle a particle system with a count of something like 50 and if you play the animation you should see the particles shooting out. Rotate the circle so that the particles are facing whichever way the gun faces in 3D space. In my case my ships are facing to the right on the x-axis so I'm just going to change it so the circle is also facing to the right. Next we need to add the object in that's going to act as our laser. Add in a cylinder and scale it up a few times on the z-axis. 
under the particle emitter settings, go to the render menu and change the type to object. Now you can just select the cylinder mesh that you've just made and that's going to swap every particle in the scene for a copy of the cylinder. If your lasers are facing the wrong way around like mine are, you can just select the cylinder in edit mode and rotate it 90 degrees in different directions until everything faces the right way. The lasers are looking a little bit limp right now but we can fix that just by increasing the normal velocity in the particle settings that basically controls how fast your particle is going to fly out. You can see that the particles are on a sort of ballistic trajectory right now, they're dropping down in the distance. We can fix that as well just by going into the scene settings in Blender and turning off gravity. To finish off the lasers just select the cylinder and in edit mode select both of the cap edges. Use Ctrl and B just to give them a little bit of bevel and round them off. Give this cylinder a material with an emission shader and pick a colour of your choice. I used green for this since I'm going to make the TIE Fighter lasers first and they're green. If you go into the bloom settings in EV you can change the brightness and the radius of the glow until it looks right for the lasers. You can make the lasers look even more like they do in Star Wars by mixing two different emission shaders together. Just give the top shader a slightly less saturated colour that's closer to white. Then using the facing output of a layer weight node, plug that into the mix factor. Just play with the strength and the colour until you get something that looks good, but you'll have these lasers that look like they're white hot in the middle and then they'll have colour around the outside. So now we've got a pretty cool looking laser system and it'll look even better once we enable motion blur. Motion blur is that blurry effect that happens when an object moves too fast for the camera's shutter speed. It's a really important factor if you want to get realism into your animations. You can enable motion blur by checking the little tick box in the render properties and you can change the amount of blur by moving this slider. Eevee does now have a motion blur system but a word of warning, it is very slow and sometimes a bit glitchy. For instance, this render took 1.9 seconds in Eevee but once I enabled motion blur that went up to like 3 times longer and the motion blur caused these weird ghost effects where lasers would appear where they shouldn't be. Since I've got this powerful NVIDIA Studio laptop, I decided just to bite the bullet and try rendering this out in cycles and actually it was really fast. In fact, it was faster to render out in cycles using optics with motion blur than what it was rendering the same frames out in Eevee, which is pretty mind blowing. The Blender Institute's been working really closely with NVIDIA to try and get optics integrated into Blender and if you've got one of the new 3000 series GPUs, you can actually utilize GPU accelerated motion blur, which is even faster. But we do have one small problem that we need to fix. Right now, the particles are always gonna face in the same direction. So if we get the emitter and we move it around or we rotate it, they're gonna come out all wonky. We can fix that by enabling the rotation checkbox in the particle settings. You can change the orientation to normal and the particles are now face the right way. Regardless of which way you point the emitter, they'll always point out the way they should. Now we just need to grab that circle and move it so it's over the barrel of the gun on the ship and then we can just parent the circle to the empty that we made to control the spacecraft. If you duplicate the emitter using Alt D, that'll make what's called a linked duplicate, which basically has all the same settings as the one that it's linked to. If any changes you make to one will be copied to all the others. Right, so now let's animate these ships. Create a curve object and place it underneath the first ship. I used a Bezier curve for this, but a path curve will work as well. If you press Alt G with the spaceship's empty selected, it should just snap to the origin point. If it doesn't, like in my case, you can also just grab it and manually move it so it's in line with the curve. So if you select the empty and you go into the constraints tab, you'll see a constraint that's called follow path. You can just apply that constraint and then select the curve that you just made as the path to follow. Now, if we select the checkbox called fixed position and we increase this offset value here, the ship will move along the curve. Zero is the start of the curve and one is the end. We can press this little circle icon that's next to the offset as well and that'll add a keyframe. So if you go to the first frame and we set it to zero and then we go to the last frame in the animation and set that to one, then the ship will move through the animation and it'll follow the curve. One problem that we have is that the ship doesn't follow the orientation of the curve. We can fix that really easy by going back into the constraints and checking this box called follow curve. So now we just have to draw out a flight path that we want the spaceship to follow. 
select the last point on the curve in edit mode and then hold down control and just right click wherever you want to extrude the new points to. You can enable the proportional editing so you can grab different points of the curve and move them around in different directions. Just make sure that you're moving it in every direction so it's going sort of up, down, left, right and all over the place. It's a space battle at the end of the day, you can move in any direction you like. Once you've got a nice curve set up, what we need to do is duplicate the curve for the other spacecraft. That's going to save us some time, but obviously we want to duplicate the curve, the second one we just made, so that it's not exactly the same as the first one, and they have a slightly different flight path. Then you just need to follow the exact same procedure that we did before. Just apply a constraint to the empty of the second ship to make it follow the second path we've made. Enable follow path and then keyframe it at the start and the end of the animation so that it follows the curve all the way through. Finally, we're going to make a third copy of the curve, but this time we're not going to constrain a ship to it, we're going to constrain the camera so that the camera is going to follow us all the way through the battle. You can keyframe the offset of the camera tracks so that it stays in front or behind the ships and you can use different keyframes to move it relative to the other ships. I want the camera to be in front of the ship for most of the animation, so what I'm going to do is give it a little bit of offset right from frame 1 so that it starts ahead of the other ships and then I'm just going to make sure that it's always in front of them by playing with the offset and keyframing it at different points where I need it to be. In order to keep the camera focused on the main ship, I'm going to add another constraint called Track 2 and I'm going to select the first ship, the one that I want to follow as the object that should be tracked to. Now the camera is going to look at the ship wherever it is in 3D space. So yeah, you just want to go through the whole animation adding in keyframes to control the relative positions of the spaceships just by changing the offset values of the mage. You can also go through and select the empty objects for them and you can rotate them in different directions. So for instance, whenever you've got a spaceship that's going around a tight corner, you might want to rotate the ship slightly so it kind of banks to the side and pitches and rolls instead of just kind of always being flat around the course. Because I made this whole video using an NVIDIA Studio laptop, I got really fantastic performance in AV due to the 2080 Max-Q graphics card in this laptop. Test frames were rendering out in just a few seconds, but I got a solid 25 frames per second in the viewport. That was really fantastic for visualising how the final render would actually look, because I could play the whole animation through without any stuttering. As good as this looked in AV, I wanted to go the extra mile for the final render, so I did it all in cycles. I used the Optics Viewport Denoiser just to see how good it would look, and it did a really amazing job of cleaning up the image in almost real time. CPU rendering would have took a prohibitively long time because it was like 20 odd seconds per frame on average, but with Optics rendering enabled on the GPU it was like 5 or 6 seconds per frame, which is unbelievably fast and it's no problem at all to knock out an animation with those sorts of speeds. You might have noticed that so far our particle system is just constantly firing, which looks really stupid. Not least of all because there's nothing in front of the Mandalorian ship for most of the animation, what's he even firing for? I was scratching my head for a long time trying to figure this out because in Blender you can't pick exactly when particles will be emitted. So all you have to do is just keep creating duplicates of your particle system and set a different start frame and end frame for whenever you want a burst of gunfire to happen. You can see right at the end of the animation here I'm just modifying the path so that the TIE fighter flies in and intercepts the particles. It's much easier to do it that way than to try and time the particles so they'll hit the TIE fighter or whatever. Just make your ship fly into it. With all that work done it's time to make a really old school Star Wars explosion. There is a simple modifier to blow up your meshes in Blender but it tends to really tank the performance of your entire timeline because it essentially turns one mesh into loads of different particles and each one of those particles have to fly through the whole scene and you end up getting a very very slow system through it but there is a way to fix that with a simple workaround. Just duplicate the ship that you want to blow up, rename the duplicate explosion mesh or crash or something like that. On the frame where the ship explodes keyframe the render visibility so that it disappears on the moment that it explodes. Then keyframe the visibility in the render of the duplicate so that it only appears on the same frame. So basically you're going to swap the position of one ship for the duplicate. Then we just need to take that duplicate mesh and really simplify it so it won't tank our performance. 
We just need it to have less polygons. You can use the decimate modifier for that, or you can just go into edit mode and use the merge by distance function and just turn up the strength so that it overly aggressively merges it all together. I know the model looks really janky, but it doesn't matter because the only time it's visible is when it's exploding, so that's probably gonna help to be honest. So with that low poly duplicate mesh selected, go to the frame where you want the ship to explode, open the search bar up and just look for the quick explode effect. You might get a warning message, but everything should be fine. That always happens for some reason. You can alter the number of particles in the settings. That's gonna basically decide how many pieces your ship's gonna blow up into. You can also alter the velocity that the particles are gonna fly away when they explode. Now, if you play the animation, the ship should blow up right as it gets hit. But that does give us a new problem. The particles all fly off in different directions when they explode, but they don't carry with them the speed that the ship had when it broke apart. We want the debris to keep moving forwards in the same direction it was going when it exploded. You can do that really easy just by adding a wind generator force into the scene with a decently high strength. If you point the wind so that it's pointing the same direction that the ship's going to go, just slightly behind where the ship will be when it explodes, that's going to propel the particles forward as they're scattered. No Star Wars explosion would be complete without a nice big fireball. Add a sphere into the scene, scale it down and move it so it's just inside where the vehicle is when it explodes. Add a particle system to the sphere, but uncheck show emitter in the particle settings to make sure that the actual sphere itself doesn't show up in the final render, just the particles will show up. Set the start frame for the particles to be the frame where the explosion happens, and set the end frame to be one frame later in the animation. Leave it on default of a thousand particles, that way we have a thousand particles that will emit just on the frame where the explosion happens. Go into the velocity and increase the normal velocity factor that will increase the speed that the particles are emitted out of the sphere. Under the physics settings for the particles you also want to increase the settings for Brownian motion that will just make the particles a little bit less uniform. If your particles fall down instead of spreading in every direction you're going to want to make sure you turn gravity off in the fail settings. Once you're happy with the way the particles look Select the sphere, go to the top of the viewport and go Mesh Quick Smoke. A bounding box is going to appear, that's the domain for the smoke. Increase the size of it so it's larger than whatever the explosion is. Go into the settings of the domain object and find the section called Cache. Change the type from Replay to Modular, then set the start and the end frame of the animation based on when the explosion happens. Select the sphere and change the type of liquid to Fire and Smoke. You'll also see a setting in there on the sphere called Flow Source. By default it's going to be set to Mesh. Change it to Particle System and in the drop down menu you should be able to see the particle system that you've made for the explosion. It's going to be the only particle system that's on the sphere mesh. Now fire is going to remit wherever there's particles. If you go back to the Domain Object settings you can enable this checkbox here called Adaptive Domain. That's going to really speed up the simulation considerably. You can set the resolution of the liquid to be at least 60, I went for something like 90, then enable the checkbox that says noise. Now you just have to hit the bake button and you should end up with an explosion. In the material settings of the domain, to make it look like fire you just need to increase the black body value and the temperature. So with all that done it's time to render out. If you're using AV you won't really have any more work to do. If you're using cycles you're going to have to add a little bit of bloom around the lights. You can do that in the compositor just by adding in a glare node set to ghost blur and you'll get that nice bit of bloom. And there you have it, your own Mandalorian Star Wars style space battle. It takes just a few hours to put something like this together but I think it looks really cool. I just want to say a big thank you to Nvidia and Scan for sponsoring this video as well as my last two videos. This Aero 15 Nvidia Studio laptop has been a real pleasure to work with and it's made creating these videos really easy and fun. Remember you can see Scan's whole range of Nvidia Studio computers by following the link in the description. Let me know what you thought of this video guys, don't forget to hit like and subscribe and I'll catch you later with another video.